Okay, well, I have uh, 6.30. So hello, everyone. I'd like to convene this meeting on August 18th, 2022 of the Board of Directors of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District. Can we have a roll call vote, please, Holly? Not vote, just the roll call. Can't hear you, Holly. No, I'm sorry, there I was you. still muted. Uh, President Mayhood. Here. Vice President Ackman. Here. Director Fulz. Here. Director Hill. Here. Director Smalley. Here. Okay. Are there any additions or deletions to the agenda? Uh, staff has none, Chair. Okay. Um, this is the time uh, in our meeting where we have oral communications from the public on items that are within the purview of the district but are not uh, listed on the agenda. Uh, do we have any, uh, I, I see that we have um, a couple of attendees and one hand up. Uh, so let's go ahead and hear from Grover Stone. Go ahead, Grover. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay. I, do, I don't think my camera is working, so I'm... That's okay. The important yeah. thing is we can hear you. Okay. I'm, I'm uh, speaking to follow up on an email that I sent on August 16th uh, about uh, a uh, vacant lot uh, that I own on Clear Creek Road, 11887 Clear Creek Road. Uh, this previously had a residential structure on it, but it burned in the CFCU fire uh, uh, together with the uh, meter, I believe. Um, and uh, we did not receive any uh, bills for quite some time, but the last two months we've been billed $45 a month uh, for what I under what I'm told is is meter maintenance um, but we're not getting any water we don't have a structure uh, there is no meter to maintain uh, and so I'm hoping that the board uh, will be able to rectify uh, this uh, this inequity uh, Rick would you like to respond to that I have received uh, Mr. Stone's email I'm not really prepared to discuss, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, and it's not agendized. There was a structure that was destroyed by fire before CZU, approximately, I think, a year before. And he was given a three-year waiver. Uh, the three-year waiver has now expired. He was not included. But then also that it burned again uh, in the CZU, it's my understanding he already had a previous waiver. I think I can handle this administratively um, and put him on the CZU fire waiver without uh, bringing this to the board. I just got the email yesterday and um, it, I'm, it's working through the process. We are working on it. If I may, I'd just like to correct uh, uh, the record on that. What happened previously was a tenant uh, uh, damaged the structure to the extent that it wasn't hab habitable any longer. Uh, and we asked for a waiver uh, to repair uh, the premises, which we did, uh, but then the repaired president premises were, were burned in the CZU fire. And then I, my understanding is that apparently you can't get a second waiver. You can you can only, you're only entitled to have one waiver, and, and we had that because of the tenant damage. We just haven't had a chance to, to let it run its course, Mr. Stone, because there was already a previous waiver. That's why that waiver expired, and then the office automatically started billing and didn't realize that then again it was destroyed by CZU. So I, I just have to go through it, and I want to double-check with legal counsel. Um, just haven't, haven't had a chance to do that, and um, uh, I should be able to do that administratively, and, and the board should not have to, to act on it. Um, so uh, I'll get back to you at the beginning of next week. Okay. Okay. Right. 
Thank All right, you. thank you. Um, uh, I do have two items for the president's report, very brief. Uh, one is that the uh, grand jury report um, was submitted. Um, there, uh, some staff person uh, did a comparison of all of the water districts and agencies that sent them in, and there was a striking alignment uh, of all the responses on this, which I which I thought was very encouraging, given that we didn't, you know, collude in any way. That we pretty much all came to the same uh, conclusion about this. Um, the the second item is to just make an announcement that. Um, some of the staff of the Santa Margarita Groundwater um, Agency has uh, scheduled a workshop on managed aquifer recharge, of which uh, aquifer storage and recovery is one subset, for September 7th from 2.30 until 5.30 p.m. Um, I don't think uh, the district has gotten um, invitations yet. They've just gone out to Santa Margarita, but I'll make sure that they go out to um, all of our board members and that will announce this. We'll, we'll put it on our website so that um, our, our uh, ratepayers can see it. I think the, the hope was is that some fraction of, uh, of our board could go. Um, and I think the hope of uh, Perrette and Rosemary was that there would be sort of an acquired uh, uh, common language so that everybody would know what we were talking about when it came time in uh, late this year to start talking about projects that we want to put forward to for this proposal that will be on the order of seven to eight million dollars um, from Santa Margarita for which we would get some significant chunk. Um, so go ahead, Rick. Yeah, on that, if, is there any um, any concerns, uh, Gina, of our board? If three or more of our board members attend that on Brown Act, do we need to notice that? Or Santa Margarita will notice that as a meeting? It becomes a little bit problematic if three or more directors are gonna actively participate. Um, the, 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 the directors are not participating in the sense that there's no discussion. This is considered, <coughs> they've invited outside speakers um, it's considered an educational thing. So I, I think this would be more like if all of our board showed up um, to learn about uh, fisheries biology or something it, it, and not discuss it. We're just learning. So I, I, I don't see this as a Brown Act issue. Okay, agreed. If it's uh, an educational program and there's no discussion of district business among three or more directors, there wouldn't be a Brown Act problem. Uh, Bob, um, we can we can have brief questions about this, but we can't discuss because it's not agendized. Yeah, just um, just clarification. I did get an invite, and did you? Okay. yeah, and Great. when you when you talk about the uh, uh, topics, um, this is referring to injection injection wells, correct? As one of the topics, just so I'm clear. I'm sorry, would you say that again? My dogs were barking and I couldn't hear you. No no worries. Um, one of the topics would be a discussion about injection wells, correct? I don't, I don't think that uh, we're getting anywhere near um, where we've been talking about the specifics of where injection wells would go. What, what, as I understand it, there would be general discussions of based on experiences in other districts, other places in the country of what are the things that uh, you have to look out for in terms of operating injection wells. And, and so, the, no, we're not, we are so far <laughs> in Santa Margarita from talking about uh, even whether we would have them, let alone where we would put them. But we're still going to get educated on it. Yes. Yes. Sure. Okay. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, go ahead, Jeff. Uh, real quick, could you just repeat the date again? Yes. It's September 7th, um, 2 30 to 5 30. It will be uh, recorded. So if people can't make it on that weekend day, um, it will be available. Um, and if you haven't received something, Jeff, uh, let me know. It might be because you're a new member of the board. You may not be on the Santa Margarita list yet. Did other board members besides Bob receive 
Yeah, I didn't. Well, you did because you're Santa Margarita, <laughs> right? No, I didn't. Yeah. Okay. So something's odd. All right. I'll 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 check on that. And make sure that everybody's in, included. And September seventh is a Tuesday, Wednesday. Okay. Sorry, Wednesday. All right. Did I get that right then, Rick? Uh, I How could we do a Wednesday? Here. Maybe I got the date, date wrong. Uh, I have a flyer here. It starts 9-7 at 2.30 to 5.30, Wednesday the 7th. Okay. I, I, okay. Jamie and I had no say in the timing of this. So I just want to say. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, okay. Great, great timing. <laughs> Um, all right, so uh, first thing is unfinished business with our uh, perennial uh, remote meeting authorization. Gina, do you feel like you need to yet again? I don't think there's any okay. meaningful updates at this time in, term of, in terms of the bases for renewing the uh, remote meeting authorization. Okay. Can I have a motion? One, one quick question. Go ahead, Bob. Sorry. So no smoke signals from Sacramento about um, doing away with it or anything like that? Uh, if there are smoke signals, I haven't learned how to read them yet. So uh, my apologies, I'll work on that. But uh, I, I don't have any updates um, okay. or predictions. Great. Thanks. Can we have a motion? I'll move the uh, recommendation to uh, ratify and readopt the resolution number four for another 30 days from today's date. I'll second. Thank you. Uh, Holly, you want to take a roll call vote on that? President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Fultz. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. We move to our first item of new business, which is the conjunctive use uh, project, uh, the budget for the CEQA study. Great, thank you. I'll go ahead and take this. Right. <laughs> All right. Um, so this, this budget not only includes the completion of the EIR process, but also the permitting and studies associated with the project, the legal review of the CEQA document, water rights changes, and updates to the conjunctive use plan itself. Um, conjunctive use refers to improving the district's surface water and groundwater supplies through conjunctively managing water resources while improving uh, stream base flows for fish. In August, the board reviewed the updated project description and approved the project description with subject to further edits. To complete the project description, a budget of approximately $13,000 was approved by the board in 2021. Uh, since then, the budget has been expended and the project description, as I just described, has been approved by the board. Uh, to complete the full EIR process, an additional budget needs to be approved. So included in this memo, Attached as Exhibit A are legal costs associated with completing the EIR process with support and review by attorneys with CEQA expertise. These costs range from approximately $43,000 to $64,000, dependent on the hours needed. Attached as Exhibit B are the costs associated with the project's fisheries biologist and author of the conjunctive use plan. To update the conjunctive use plan, guide the district through water rights and permitting processes, and support fisheries-related studies to complete the EIR. This total is $40,000. As attachment C are the costs of Rincon consultants to complete the EIR document and process. The original $13,000 approved to complete the project description has been removed from the total cost, making the contract amendment for approval a total of approximately $132,000. So the total cost for the consultants to assist the district in completing the EIR and other associated tasks involved with the conjunctive use plan are, or are $236,308. So it is recommended that the Board of Directors review this memo, approve the updated budget for the district's conjunctive use plan EIR, and authorize the district manager in, to enter into professional service contract amendments and not to exceed amounts of $132,058 with Rincon, $64,250 with Nossaman, and $40,000 with Mike Potlick. Staff is prepared to ask any or answer any questions that the board may have. Okay, thank you, Jamie. 
Uh, Scar Carly, I was thinking ahead to asking Jamie if she had any questions to begin the discussion. Um, I, I guess uh, nothing that was um, a surprise to me in any of this. Uh, I, I did wonder in the budget for the EIR, um, what kind of um, public scoping meeting are we holding? And is that something, um, you know, that we're going to have to do like, you know, advertising and notification around? Um, and if so, uh, you know, how many days in advance are we going to have to do that? So it kind of like, what's the timing for that? Do we have any sense of it? Right, that's a good question. Um, as far as the timing, I I believe there's a certain period that needs to be noticed. Um, as part of the CEQA process, uh, but that will that is included in RINCON's uh, scope and we'll be either able to hold it as part of a regular board of directors meeting or we can also hold a special meeting. Um, and I can get you the, the exact dates that we need um, for that scheduling. And I don't know if Gina knows that off the top of. I don't know it off the top okay. of my head, but I'm looking right now to see if okay. I can get an answer. Okay. That's it for me, thanks. Uh, Bob, did you have any comments or questions? I do. Um, Carly, any grant possibilities for helping fund this? Potentially, um, we are actually looking into grant funding as part of the Santa Margarita, Ground, Santa Margarita Groundwater Agency's uh, DWR grants that we're pursuing. So we're hoping to find some funding through that. And then as far as the upgrades and actual infrastructure changes, like the treatment plant upgrades, uh, that's definitely eligible for funding. So once we get through further into the process, um, we'll definitely be pursuing funding for the infrastructure. Yeah, no, I get I get that. I was wanting to. Okay. Um, and my understanding by reading this is that Stillwater is basically doing a peer review on Mike uh, Pudlick's work. Exactly. Okay. Um, and is there any advantage to going out to bid on this? Potentially. Um, I think the issue at this point, just because we've already gone through the initial study uh, with RINCON, it would be difficult to bring someone on board and really get us started quickly. Um, I think the advantage going with RINCON at this point is that they're familiar with the project and we'd be able to hopefully move it along pretty quickly or relatively quickly. So, so really the reasons for not going to bid are uh, speed and um, project familiarity at a deep level, which somebody new would have to come up to speed on, and that would take more time. Exactly. Okay. Um, I, I did want to just, you know, once again, sorry, um, comment that, you know, there's a line in here about significant concerns were raised during the public review period. I want to say once again, those concerns were primarily the city of Santa Cruz and a few of the other regulatory agencies, not anybody from the public. I think the public clearly understands, or at least the vast majority of the public clearly understands the advantages of shifting water to surface water to areas like Scotts Valley, where we're on groundwater, uh, or at least historically have been, in order to make maximum use of uh, surface water during rainy times, uh, thereby um, not using wells as much. That'll help the groundwater situation. And by being efficient in how we shift water around from various sources to various destinations, we can also help improve the flow for the fish. Um, I wish that the um, agencies that had commented on this had recognized that timing is important here. The longer it goes, the less benefit either the fish or the people get. And I, I'm disappointed that we weren't able to work this out without having to go through the time and expense of an, of an EIR process. Um, but here we are, and uh, I'm in favor of moving forward. Thank you, Bob. Um, Jeff, did you have any questions or comments? Um, overall, I'm strongly in favor of this. Uh, quick question though, where does this fit in the budget? Where is this? Where are these funds coming from? That's a great question. Rick, would you be able to weigh in on that? I believe we we did budget, um, but not for that high of an amount originally. Um, and I don't know what the, the amount was. So this is an adjustment to the budget of some sort, yes. Right. Yes, this would be an adjustment. And uh, does this fall under capital expense or 
under uh, operating expense or have we determined that yet? I'd have to look to see where we budget it. If we bud, I'm not quite sure uh, if we budget it under capital. Um, I don't think so, but I'll double check that and, and get an answer back to the board. Yeah, in the past, I believe it was the environmental department's yeah. budget. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I guess that, it seems to me that it should be charged to capital expenses because we wouldn't be doing yeah. this <laughs> if yes. we weren't trying to build something. Um, yeah, and I, uh, I think the yes. closer we get to that, the more it goes into capital as opposed yeah. to operating. Yeah. Right. Yes. So I, 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 if it isn't there now, let's make it there. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, Mark. Um, I have a number of questions. Um, Nossiman's budget uh, makes assumptions for what the CEQA consultant will do and others. Um, I see similar statements in all three proposals of, um, we assume that others are doing this. Um, I want to make, I want to confirm that all of these assumptions of work being done by others is appropriately covered by the team that we have here. And I want to know if you've had discussions along that level yet, Carly, with. Yeah, um, Gina, and your, and your budget with the others, was that referring to people, other agencies and during the comment period, or I would have to look at the budget. Uh, I'm trying to look right now and see okay. where others appears. Um, it's in it's it's not just uh, work being done by others. It's also that we assume that this is being done by the CEQA consultant mm -hmm. um, and or and others. Um, and I see some similar statements in at least uh, Rincons and I think Podlix also. I just want to make sure that um, we don't have to go get a contract from the buy others consulting company to do the work that's <laughs> covered by others here for an additional uh, $25,000. Right. I, I can't imagine what the others would be referring to without spending a little more time looking at each okay. uh, then, budget a little harder. but. Um, then I then I do request um, if the board approves this, one of the first things uh, in your process as part of a kickoff meeting, not with each of the individuals, but with the team. Mm -hmm. um, before you have that kickoff meeting, circulate the proposals from Nossiman to the other two, from Podlick to the other two, so that they can all see what um, each of the other team members are committing to do. And what the other team members are expecting to be done by either the secret consultant or by the others to make sure that there are no gaps, at least, you know, going in up front. Okay, yep, that's easily done. Um, luckily, all the the members of this team or all these consultants have worked together um, through the Agreed. of use uh, yes. initial study and writing of the plan. So, okay, he's familiar. Yeah. Okay, uh, my second is on the on the budget amount for uh, Nossiman. Uh, it's a range uh, between uh, forty three and uh, 60, 60 something. Um, um, and, and I understand that you can't predict the number of, of hours uh, at this point going into this. But um, if we authorize this for the total amount of the 64,250, um, I, I think it's very likely that that's at least what will be spent. Um, is it appropriate to put some cap on it instead of that range, such as a midpoint of 50,000? I don't 
don't think we have an issue with that. You know, um, if that's what the board desires. We certainly could do that and then come back. And without hindering the staff so that um, if it does, ex so that we're setting up a, a target that's lower than that full 64 to 250. Um, and, and if um, Nossiman's team sees that they need to go over that, come back for a discussion with the staff, with the board authorizing staff to have that discussion. If you see that they're justified, if it's justified, go ahead with it. So, so if I hear you, Mark, what you're saying is we uh, put a cap of 50,000 on Nossiman and we see we're going over staff can make the decision or do you want that yes to I, I i'm comfortable with staff making that decision oh, I'm, I'm comfortable with that okay well, okay well i guess the logic of this then fails me because if you're comfortable with the staff making that decision um then just arbitrarily there's no reason to set it right because the staff at any time could say you know what nasuman we're at 50 and we think that's enough so the, the yeah. only thing that would make sense is if you want to uh, require it to come back to the board. And, um, because the staff at all times could do what you're, you're, you're saying. And I guess I would feel pretty strongly that I, I don't want to come back to the board um, I, to authorize, you know, $10,000 expenses. I, I agree. I, I don't want this to come back to the board. Um, I agree with that. So yeah. I, I think I, I guess what I'm hearing is that you just basically want the staff to take it under advisement that they will keep an eye um, on this and hopefully target something. But I think, at, you know, our job as a board is to set um, but, as in the recommendation and not to yes. extend them out. And, yes. Yeah. And, and, and I would hope that budgets are tracked on a monthly basis. Uh, um, Invoices are accumulated that way so that we can see that you're ideally 50% of the way complete with the work, but only 40% expended on budget or something like that. But that's and that's how we do it. Okay. All right. Thank and you. We will keep track of we keep track of all consultants' budgets that way. You know, we don't want to exceed a contract. We right. want to be uh, in front of it. So yeah, okay. that's no problem. Okay. Um, on page 16 of the agenda packet, um, which is part of Podlex, uh proposal, um, there's a reference uh, that the analysis of our district's Loch Lomond allotment um, would be uh, done at may need to be done at some point in the future. Um, when is that? Could you be a little more specific, Mark, about what you're referring to here? Sure. Um, um, I'm... It's in it's in the last paragraph. I'm I'm searching for that right now. Right underneath the cost estimate, I do believe. Yeah, right underneath the cost estimate. Okay. Uh, that um, he argues that the district did not analyze this. Uh, he continues to maintain that that we don't need to. Uh, however, if such an analysis is ultimately required, my question is, well. Who's going to decide when if that part of the analysis is required? Uh, and and staff going into this, you know, when Santa Cruz made uh, their comments on the draft plan, they listed many comments that you know, staff feels they just kept piling on. We We don't agree with this to do this analysis we we feel this is santa cruz's responsibility not the district mm -hmm. they should have done it with their uh process so uh, as it is stands now the district is not willing to take on that analysis okay 
Okay. Um, since we've done a lot of other work with Podlick, uh, do we have his uh, labor rates? Um, is this a time and materials estimate that we're getting from him? Because we don't see, unlike with Nossaman's estimate and Rincon's, any projected amount of hours. This is just dollar figures. Right, so that, that is based on his hourly rate. Um, and I believe, I, like you said, the hours and the rate aren't displayed, but I can get that from him if that, that's. Okay. Um, I, I don't need to see it, but I would like to make sure that you do so that you have an idea of what, because I've had a consultant once submit bill for one of the tasks. And I said, but you spent three hours. That's okay. We saw that this task was going to cost $5,000. That's what you got to pay us. We'll so. get that hourly rate and attach it to the purchase order and contract. Yeah. Okay. And, okay. and uh, Podlick does include his hours and the rate on his invoices. Yeah. And on the other projects. Okay. Okay. Um, on page um, 28, task two. The project description. Uh, this is on Rincon's estimate. Um, I thought the board already reviewed a fairly complete project description, which we authorized uh, thirteen thousand for. Right, that's correct. So we just took the original uh, proposal and just took out the cost for the task two, which was the $13,000. So anything that pertained to the project description has been removed from the budget that we asked for tonight. So it would just be an amendment to the contract we awarded at the 13000 Right. But on page 28 of mm -hmm. the agenda, project description has a, a line item of uh, $8,171 uh, and 46 hours. Uh, right, so we did have to pull in um, project management hours as well as part of that budget. So it wasn't just the project description. There was a few other pieces that we pulled out um, hour wise. And I have the breakdown. I don't, I didn't include it in this uh, this item, so I apologize about that, but we did break it out so they could complete the project description in the kickoff meeting. I believe the other cost was the kickoff meeting as well. Um, Gina, did you go ahead? Uh, I'm just wondering um, if I'm, responses here to point out, is it correct, Carly, that that 13,000 was deducted from the 145, 40, 449? That's correct. With that? Uh, attachment. D does that answer your question, Mark? Um, uh, if the so the the thirteen thousand being deducted from the total one forty five, um, eight thousand. The eight thousand figure that we're seeing there um, is part of that thirteen already. Correct. So they're not doing further additional work for the um, project description for, right. for another eight thousand dollars worth of work. It's done. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's correct. Okay. I was misinterpreting uh, that portion of the line item. Okay. Uh, those are all the questions I have. Thank you. Jeff? Okay, so I'd like to go back to page 16 here, uh, which Mark was referring to on the uh, question of uh, whether or not this uh, additional analysis is required. It, it's my understanding that one of our points of disagreement with the city of Santa Cruz is exactly how this water would be pulled and, and where it would be stored and how it would be sent back. And, this seems to, when I read this paragraph, it seems that their objection to this is, or their their issue here was that uh, an analysis was needed and we say, no, it isn't because of a particular reason, a particular 
uh, method of taking the water and storing it. But I, it's my understanding we don't have an agreement with them on what method would be used to take and store it and where it would be stored. So I... Right. So this is actually directly referring to the, the city's habitat conservation plan and what they're doing for fisheries and bypass. Uh, okay. Gina, is it okay to talk about this? Um, yeah, certainly it, it is. Um, I, I just wanted to add that I, I think this is going to be one of the first things that our CEQA legal team is going to look at yeah. with the district and the RINCON consultants. Yeah. Yeah, th this needs to okay. be looked at because it, okay, good. It's, it's my understanding that you know we are not in agreement with them on where we would pull the water and where it would be stored, and until that is done, we really can't decide whether an ad additional analysis is needed or not. So I think uh, Jeff, I I would dispute that a little bit. Uh, I I think our position is that we have a contractual right to that water, and I'm that I'm not disputing that. No, I know, but what I'm saying is it, it, that it, it is not our problem to solve uh, in terms of uh, when we take the water or whatever. In other words, we have a contractual right and we can take it anytime we want. It is Santa Cruz's problem to figure out the impact depending on the time or where. And we do not want to get into the job of dealing with that because that is like has an infinite possibility of of combinations of when where and how and um so that this is not a road we want to go down and I, I like i feel really strongly on that and you know until it becomes absolutely clear that there's something that we have to do so okay that's enough okay bob you had your hand Oh, Mark is in front of me. So. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I didn't. I couldn't tell which was which. All right, Mark, go ahead. Um, is it uh, appropriate that when it comes to having the EIR completed and comments are submitted, if the city is still in disagreement, we don't have to fully resolve their comments. That's right. It will go on to the state from there. And the state's reviewers can then either approve or review those comments and say further work needs to be done. Right. But and and who knows what we, you know, we may have to go back yeah. and do some of these things, but we should presuppose that we have to. Yeah. Right. And Santa Cruz is not in the driver's seat to decide whether we have to or not. State reviewers would be. Okay. Uh, Bob. Well, it may still be a forlorn hope, but I would very much like to think that we would be able to find a way for Santa Cruz and San Lorenzo Valley to actually collaborate in things that, that would be a benefit to the overall community, our groundwater and our surface water and do so in a way that doesn't continue to extract lots and lots of money out of the ratepayers' pockets. Um, Perhaps we can get there someday. I certainly know I would like to be there. Um, so I, I'm, I'm hopeful, Rick, that that you and staff will maybe be able to get us there, and and hopefully Rosemary and her team can come to the table in the same way. Um, I did want to just ask a quick question about storage because if we take the water out of Loch Lomond, it, it's like, well, storage. <laughs> I mean, we got tanks, but um the, there's there's no storage beyond that they're the storage and we're taking it out when we need it so i i'm not even sure how that's um relevant to the process unless they're trying to figure out some way to backdoor injection wells well um let's just let's just get it all out on the table instead of and just you know have a discussion about it rather than trying to do these backdoor things where you know we're trying to do this that and the other um I, I think the community should definitely be involved in that kind of a a very straightforward transparent um you know minimize the politics just look at the science and expense not only capital but operating and all the rest of it and come to a conclusion if they want to do it um great okay 
Um, any, any more comments by members of the board before I go out to the public? Let's see, we have, uh, okay, go ahead, Mark. Um, I'd like to make a motion before we go out to the public. Sure. If that's okay. That's all right. Um, I'd like to make a motion that uh, the board approve um, the recommendation is put for us, put forth uh, in front of us to authorize the district manager to enter into professional services contract amendments in the not to exceed amounts of $132,058 with Rincon, $64,250 with Nossaman, and $40,000 with Mike Podolek. I second it. Okay, so now we'll go and ask uh, members of the public, which is a grand total of two right now, uh, whether they would like to comment on this. Mark and Bruce, would you like to comment? Raise your hand if you would. Okay, I don't see hands raised. So are there any final questions or comments from members of the board before we go to a vote? Okay, go ahead, Holly. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Fultz? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Motion passes unanimously. Um, next item of new business is the recommendation to award construction of the 2021 Capital Improvement uh, Projects Pipeline Project. And the, the district engineer is here to present this item to the board. Josh. Thank you, Rick. Good evening, all. This one's a bit of a doozy. So as many of you are aware, this is the largest project that we've taken on, certainly that I know of. This project entails a variety of proactive facility improvements as opposed to the CZU fire recovery sorts of things that we've been doing a lot of lately. I'm gonna enumerate them a little bit and then I will make my recommendation to the board. First is a new 120,000 gallon active storage tank at Blue Ridge, which is intended to provide improved potable water supply to the Blue Ridge zone, as well as improved fire protection. Next is replacement of mains in the Hermosa and Fernwood and Oak area off of Glen Arbor, where currently we have a large quantity of leaky pipe that is problematic and is eating huge amounts of staff time to address. So that's all going to be updated. We'll be replacing undersized mains in Ormond Road. Uh, currently the main up there is a two inch main that has an aerial creek crossing that has been exceedingly problematic over the years. We will be eliminating that creek crossing and replacing the main up to the top of Orman, which is going to improve both pressure and flow for all of the residents, as well as significantly improving fire protection. We will also be adding at least one hydrant in that location, possibly two, depending on the condition of one of the existing hydrants, which we will determine when we get there. We'll be Replacing undersized mains in the Juanita Woods neighborhood. Uh, it's gonna improve flow and pressure of potable water to the neighborhood there. It's going to improve fire protection vastly. Again, we're going from a two inch main, which is wildly undersized to an eight inch and adding a couple of hydrants. As a side effect of that, the folks in the neighborhood will, after being unhappy about the construction project, be very happy about their new road. Uh, it's just part of the cost of doing business there. We will, as the final portion of this, be replacing the main running from East Ziani Road up Ziani Drive to the Lompico Intertie. This particular main is existing is a four inch, which is insufficient to supply the intertie and is frankly insufficient to supply potable water to that neighborhood and certainly not enough for fire protection. We'll be upgrading to an eight inch as has become our district, district standard. Uh, this will have an additional benefit beyond the potable water improvements and the fire protection improvements of reducing the noise from our inner tie because we'll be able to reduce, we'll able, excuse me, we'll be able to 
eliminate our day tank, which is going to move one of the noisier parts of that system. So it's going to just going to remove it, which is going to have the pleasant side effect of making the folks up there a lot happier about the level of noise. This project came in at, let's see here, the low bid, as I get to the correct place, is $5,023,379.57 from an outfit called JMB Construction. Now, there's two things here I'd like to address. The first is, where is that money coming from? That is planned to come from the $15 million uh, COP loan. And in comparing this cost of just over $5 million to the projected cost from before my time here, but from when we put this loan together, that cost was estimated to be 5.8 million plus a 15% contingency leading to 6.7 million roughly. So this bid has come in well under that. Uh, recent experience has told us that by the time we can get pipe, those costs will have gone up. I imagine we will end up much closer to the original estimate, but at least we're starting lower. The second thing that I'd like to address in terms of JMB construction, because we have not done business with this contractor in the past, I and members of my staff have spent a significant amount of time looking into their background, due diligence work. I've had extensive conversations with representatives from San Francisco's PUC, East Bay Mud, the city of Burlingame, and the city of San Bruno, each of which has used JMB successfully for projects on this scale or larger. In addition, I've had some conversations with a couple of engineering firms with whom the district has experience, Sandus and Freyer Loretta, who have also had experience with JMB construction on previous projects where those engineering firms were acting as construction managers or as engineering support. And I'm happy to report that across the entirety of my research, feedback has been just really good. It's been uniformly quite positive. Uh, more than one owner's representative has said to me, if JMB is on your project, you're a lucky man, which, well, you know, discounting for they may have had a, a particularly good experience is still a pretty positive recommendation. Based on that, I have uh, provided a motion for the board and recommend that this project be awarded to JMB Construction in the amount of $5,023,379.57. With that, I will cheerfully take questions. Thank you, Josh. We'll go ahead and start with Mark, who's the uh, chair of the Engineering and Environmental Committee. Um, I was going to pose the question, did you talk to any references that were not on the reference list? But you've already addressed that. So great. Uh, good. I don't have any other questions. This uh, proposal uh, or motion looks good to me. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Bob, you're also on that committee. Yes, thank you. Just had to click my mute off. Um, okay, so I want to make a few comments and then ask a question. Um, actually, two questions. So the Zyandi Road um, project, Josh, is that part of, actually, this is more of a question, but is that part of the Lompico Assessment District um, uh, funding? There are two parts to that answer. This project does benefit the Lompico Assessment District because it directly benefits Lompico, but it also directly benefits the Zayani Drive neighborhood, which is below the inner tie and thus not part of Zayani or not part of Lompico. And my understanding is that none of our none of the funding for this project is coming from the Lompico Assessment District. Well, that, that's not exactly what I asked. So is this project part of what was originally um, included in the Lompico Assessment District funding? That is a question I will need to defer to Rick. 
It looks like Rick has his hand up, ready to answer that question. And he's on mute. Rick, Rick you're, you're muted. Rick is still muted. There we go. Yes, Bob, you're correct. That project is part of the Lumpico Assessment District. It was outlined in the in the LAVCO resolution. Um, as you know, we've uh, expensed all the Lumpico uh, assessment district funds. Sure. So the yeah. district will be paying for this out of the loan. Right. And so I, I believe then that this outside of the service line, this represents the last um, um, project in the uh, Lumpico assessment district promises that were made. So we've done the P, we've done the tanks, we've done the PRVs, we're now doing this line. We didn't have to do the uh, treatment um, uh, system. So the only thing left is the service lines. That's correct. Great. Um, my com I had a comment here about the number of bidders. So Josh, I think your strategy of bundling a bunch of things together makes a lot of sense because when I look at these bidders here, these are, I mean, these are the kind of people we want to bid on these projects. Um, and I'm really happy that we got as many of them as we did. I noticed that at least three of them are, are, are previous, um, are companies that have done work for us in the past. So, you know, this is a really good thing. Um, I did have a question about JMV construction though. Uh, all of the locations you talked about are, are what I would call uh, sort of urban areas, right? Um, you know, our roads are not urban. What experience do they have working in our kind of environment? Valid question. And let me flip back through my notes to my conversations with one specific member. Uh, let's see. It was Brisbane. Uh, when I spoke to the folks at Brisbane, they did mention that the work that had been done what did include some work up in the hills of Brisbane, which granted not one lane roads like we have, not roads in the condition that we have. Mm -hmm. However, they are they are experienced with tight roads, tight corners, traffic control that's associated with it. And honestly, that's my biggest concern in those types of areas is safety and that's mm -hmm. traffic control. Right. And to that extent, I believe that they have relevant experience in terms of are they used to dealing with the sometimes cantankerous people that they might run into on our mountainous roads? I don't no, know. And no honestly, I have no way of knowing. Yeah, no. Well, I, I mean, it was an interesting thing for me because for $150,000, uh, you know, we're, we're sort of going with, with somebody that's not known. Um, to us anyway. So I wanted to make sure that all of that was checked out and that we think they're going to, because we don't want to have another, you know, sort of not great experience. You know, I, after feeling like I had pushed us in the direction of a particular contractor that did not work on a previous project, I, I felt a little burned by that. And I feel like I got everyone else Burned as well, you know, the district as a whole into trouble with that. And I feel like I did my due diligence on it, but it still didn't work out the way I wanted it to. So I, I put a little extra time in on this, particularly in terms of how well does this contractor work with changes to their expectations? And how well does this contractor deal with specific direction from an engineering firm? Or from a construction manager that may or may not be obvious to a contractor who's got his shovel in the ground. And again, uniformly, it has been positive. They have been presented to me as very much a can do kind of company. And if it were two people telling me that or three people telling me that, I'd still be suspicious. It's not, it's close to a dozen. Well, you know, the real good upside in this, Josh, um, assuming that it works out the way we expect, is that we'll have another company that we have experience with and that has experience up here. And as you know, I'm very interested in making sure we expand the breadth of bidders on these kinds of projects. I think we'll get better pricing 
And I think that's reflected in the fact that this cost here is um, under what we had originally projected. Um, could you explain for us and the public what is in the agreement with them relative to how quickly we can get materials? And if there's another eight or nine months delay, what's going to happen to cost? Uh, the escalation clauses. We have two clauses that we have recently added to our general conditions. Gina, thank you very much for your help on this. It has been invaluable. One clause is related to cost of materials, specifically ductile iron pipe. I limited the escalation clause to ductile iron pipe and related fittings because one, that's the vast majority of what we're going to be paying for in terms of materials. Right. And two, all of those things have a common factor in that they can be related directly to an indexed price. In this case, we're looking at the scrap steel index price, which I could dig up some. Uh, some documentation for you if you'd like, show you the graphs. It okay. mirrors the ductile iron pipe costs, mirror the cost fairly closely, or at least mirror the changes fairly closely to scrap steel. So what we have done is set up a clause in the general conditions that says, once the cost of materials exceeds 5% greater than what the contractor bid based on, with the contractor having provided us with the quote they got from their supplier at the time of bid, then we say to them, whatever the percentage difference is between the cost, well, the scrap steel index price at the day of bid closing and the day that materials arrive on site, whatever that percentage is, we will allow them to mark up their materials that percent. We don't want them having to pay for the change of materials cost but we also don't want to have to pay extra. So that's how we've laid that out. It's the opinion of staff that ancillary materials, concrete, asphalt, that sort of thing, while those prices can change, we could end up on the hook for those changes. Those changes are unlikely to be of any real significance. The other piece of this is labor. Labor changes are fairly easy to track because everything we do requires conformance with prevailing wage in the state. So there's a fixed prevailing wage. And if a contractor comes to us and says, hey, it took eight months to get pipe in that time, prevailing wage for this area has changed. It has gone from this number to this number plus 3% or whatever the change is. Then we will agree to a markup of their costs, of their labor costs of that percentage so that we are still paying them the current, at the time the project is done, or the work is done, prevailing wage. So those are the two pieces that we put in to protect the district from unreasonable cost increases based on delay. Excellent. Thank you for going through that. I think that's important for all of us and more importantly, the public to hear about what we've done. Um, it sounds to me like you've done a, a lot of diligence in this, Josh. I thank you for, thank you for doing that. And um, I'm going to hope that the pipe will come in um, maybe quicker or at least not worse than what we're seeing right now. And that we can come in under that 6.7 million. Um, if we can keep coming in under our original estimates, that means more money for other projects. Thanks much. Thank you. Okay, Jamie, any questions or comments? No, thank you. Okay. Uh, Jeff. Not really a question, but an observation. Um, the difference between JMB and the next low bidder, next lowest bidder uh, for the total project is 3.1%, which was pretty close. Uh, but I went through the portion of the contract that the, I don't know if you can see this, you know, the, the, the bid schedule of values for the two. And curiously enough, and maybe this reflects that the different companies have different sets of experience and different areas of expertise, but there's some rather large variances from one company to another on individual line items. It all adds up to almost exactly the same. But to give you an example, we talked earlier about traffic and road closures. Um, 
JMB has $280,000 listed in there for traffic and road closures. The next lowest bidder has $100,000. Um, then if you go, uh, there's a line item here, points of connection to existing system one inch services, and they're supposedly bidding on 130 connections. Um, JMB has that at 388,000. The next lowest bidder has that at 585,000. So the one bidder is higher on this, lower on that, and vice versa. Uh, it all came out in the wash to 3.1%, but it's interesting to see how they, uh, ver you know, how the costs vary by line item and how they arrived at their pricing. And I don't know is, if that had any impact on that for us, but it's it's an interesting observation. What I was looking for was to see if somebody had made some gross mistake or something like that. And indeed. I didn't see that. That is one of the things that I also look through everything for because the last thing we want is to find ourselves on the hook for several hundred thousand dollars because there was an arithmetic error that I didn't catch. Um, in a little insight, if you will, into how contractors bid. Different contractors will, as you noted, choose to emphasize different line items. They will, they will choose to bury costs that they don't want to talk about or costs that are not specifically called out as bid items in different locations. Some will put it into mobilization. Some would rather put those extra costs into traffic control. Some would rather put them into something that is not a lump sum, whether that's services, as you pointed out, or cost per linear foot of pipe, or you know, pretty much anything, connections to the, the existing system. My philosophy on that is I want to go through the, the bid schedule and make sure that it is internally consistent. Each of the contractors bids is internally consistent. And then I want to look at the bottom line. Once I know that none of them have missed anything and none of them have made any obvious arithmetic errors or left anything out or added anything in, then it feels to me like the bottom line comparison is really the one we care about. There are certain things that as unit costs, could be large factors because of a large number of units. A very small change in cost per linear foot of pipe on a 7,000 linear foot project can be pretty significant. So that is a thing that I do keep an eye on. But I, I think that just thinking about how contractors put their bids together, it is a combination of, as you noted, different areas of expertise. Some guys can get particular jobs done more efficiently because of greater experience level or particular crews or location or what have you. And where particular companies want to essentially add in things that are not actually bid items but need to be part of the project. So I hope that clears things up more than muddies them further. Well, that's that's kind of what I expected, um, and, but it was just interesting to see. Uh, one of these guys is obviously much better at paving than the other one, for example. <laughs> yes. So, um, I, I guess it's my turn, and I, I th thank you for that short course in uh, construction bidding. Uh, you actually educated me a lot. I, I enjoyed hearing about that, Josh. That 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 was a lot of insight. Um, I, I also just have to say that I am thrilled that we're talking about something that is not the CZU fire or you know, some other putting out a brush fire that we're actually making progress um, on these capital improvement things that we've talked about so long. And I think we should um, give our staff and, and for that matter ourselves a little bit of a pat on the back that, that despite all the other things that we're having to deal with, we're finally making progress on these capital projects that will make life better for all the folks in the Valley. So thank you so much, Josh, to you and, and all the other staff that have worked hard on this. And also to uh, Mark, I know you've put a lot of effort into it too, and Bob, your involvement with the committee. So, so bravo. <laughs>
Yes. Any comments from the public? I don't see any. Uh, is there a motion? Yes, I'd like to make motion. Uh, the board direct the district manager to enter into a contract with GMB Construction Incorporated for construction activities related to the 2021 CIP pipeline project in conformance with the GMB Construction Incorporated bid in the amount of five million twenty three thousand three hundred seventy nine dollars and fifty seven cents. I'll second that, <coughs> and not a penny more. Yeah, I was gonna say, really? <laughs> 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 oh, I don't know. Can we round up the zeros? <laughs> Right up until that first change order. <laughs> yeah, right, exactly. Oh, man. Okay, Holly, go ahead. President Mayhood? Aye. Vice President Ackman? Yes. Director Pulse? Yes. Director Hill? Yes. Director Smalley? Yes. Okay, great. Passed unanimously. Onward to item C among new business is the ongoing exploration of a possible consolidation of Big Basin Mutual Water Company's water system into the district. And Rick, is you or Gina that wants to lead that? Sure, I'll, I'll start out and, and if Gina can jump in at any time as she wishes. Uh, back in October 2021, uh, owners of Big Basin Water requested that the district explore possible consolidation of their water system into the district. Uh, the district's board of uh, direct directors approved the request with certain conditions. Uh, since then, uh, a number of discussions have occurred with uh, Big Basin Water and with agency partners in the effort to help a Big Basin service area, but no agreements um, have been reached yet. One of the issues under discussion has been uh, the disposition of uh, real property, specifically the, the watershed. 540 acres of watershed and other parcels which contain facilities uh, that the district uh, would need uh, in exploring a potential uh, consolidation. Um, this item is to request that the board by motion designate the, the district manager and district council as representatives of the district for negotiations with Big Basin uh, Water regarding real property. Um, uh, we uh, also uh, have been in discussion uh, regarding the watershed property and other facilities that the district must uh, be involved in any discussion with any partners. And with that, I'll turn it back over to you. And Gina, do you want to add anything to that? Well, I guess, thanks, Rick. The only thing I wanted to add is that um, the, the main purpose of this uh, agenda item is that we have run into some issues related to the negotiations that pertain to real property that we'd like to consult with the board about in closed session. And so that's really the focus of the agenda item we were hoping to, um, if we could, to focus discussion around that recommendation. Um, Jeff, uh, can we start with you? If you have any questions or comments? Um, this all makes sense to me. I mean, I understand that there may be some, I'm sure there will be closed session items that come out of this, but designating uh, Gina and uh, Rick as the um, point personnel to deal with this certainly makes sense to me. Mark? Yes, um, as the board's uh, representative that's been involved in some of these discussions with um, county and other parties on Big Basin. Um, I agree that what Gina said, it would be advantageous to be able to talk about these with the rest of the board. Um, and I concur with, with what's being proposed here as uh, designating Gina and Rick as negotiators. For <clears throat> okay, Jamie? Um, I mean, I, I, I think this seems like a reasonable path forward. I'm, um, you know, just wondering if 
and maybe this is going to come back at some point, but is there also going to need to be some kind of an outside appraiser that's agreed upon as part of this process, or is that one of the items that we may need to discuss further? Rick, Gina? do you mind if I take a stab yeah, at that? Um, that? That may be part of the process. It's um, the status, that there has been a, a retention of an appraiser, I believe, but the, the, the posture, the procedural posture of it is a little bit um, unusual. And, and I think if possible, we'd like to continue that discussion in closed session. Okay, thank you. Bob? Yeah, and that, that was my assumption of why you put it on there. So glad to, glad to hear that because I think there's a, there's, a, there's a lot of things we need to talk about. Um, and I think no, no least of which would be grant funding um, uh, as, as possibly the way that this whole thing is going to come together. So is that going to include financing uh, discussions as well um, in, in close session? Uh, to the extent that these things are all interrelated, then, then yes. Um, the, the, the key issue here is um, whether some financial security can be obtained from the real estate. And if not, the district may need to look other places for it. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, any other comments from members of the board? If not, I'll go out to um, our attendees. Would any of them like to comment on this? I don't see any hands up. Um, can I have a motion? I move that we designate the district manager and district council as representatives of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District for negotiations with Big Basin Water Company regarding real property. Second that. Second. Okay. Go ahead, Holly. President Mayhood. Hi. Vice President Ackman. Yes. Director Fulz. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Okay. Passes unanimously. Um, we have our uh, now a. The next item is annual disclosure report of employee reimbursements. Uh, this is sort of a housekeeping issue, but Rick, do you want to give a brief? This is definitely a, an annual uh, housekeeping issue in accordance with the government code. Each special district shall at least annually disclose and make available for public inspection any reimbursements paid by the district uh, within the immediate uh, preceding fiscal year of at least $100 for each individual charge of services for a product received. Attached you will, uh, to the agenda item, you will see a list of uh, disbursements of $100 and greater to different staff. The majority of those disbursements are for uniform uh, certifications and some mileage. Okay. Uh, are there any comments or questions from members of the board? Jamie. Um, I was just curious um, if you could refresh my memory. Is there a, a, a uniform allowance um, built into the uh, employee benefit? There is. Uh, each employee uh, has a uniform allowance, and we have a um, an approved garment list uh, that they must pick from, uh, including steel-toed shoes. They purchase uh, those items, and they submit for reimbursement. I appreciate that. And I hope that we allow them to purchase multiple sets because I know when I used to work for San Jose Water, sometimes those guys went full under and they had to completely change top to bottom several times a day, depending on what they were working on. That's correct. Okay. Any other comments from members of the board? Okay. Uh, seeing none, are there any comments from members of the public? Okay, um, if not, I would like to move that the Board of Directors accept and file the annual disclosure report of employee reimbursements for fiscal year 2021-2022. I'll second I'll that. I'll second that. Okay, thank you. Holly? 
President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Hill. Yes. Director Smalley. Yes. Passes unanimously. Our final item of uh, new business is a memo uh, MOU concerning classified and management supervisory and confidential employees and uh, essentially appointing negotiators regarding this. Go ahead, Rick. And this one, the district council will present to oh, okay. uh, the board. Okay, thank you, Chair May Hood and, and Rick. Um, this item will look familiar uh, to those of you who've been on the board for multiple years. Um, every year, since it's, the MOUs are now quite a few years old, the, the management and the classified MOU. Um, and as a result, every year, uh, they potentially come up for renewal. Um, the window for either party to either of the MOUs to give notice of their intent to negotiate regarding the MOU uh, runs from 120 days before the end of the year to 90 days before the end of the year. So in effect, any party, um, either the management employee bargaining unit or the district or for the classified uh, union MOU, either the district or the union, can give notice between September 2nd and October 2nd of a desire to uh, negotiate with respect to their uh, particular MOU. Um, this has not been done since the MOUs were entered into in, was it 2017, Rick, I believe? 19. Um, so, uh, Neither party has given notice to renegotiate for, for quite a few years, but the union has given the district manager notice of a desire to negotiate uh, regarding the union MOU this year, and it's anticipated that a similar notice will be forthcoming from the management employees. And so the purpose of the agenda item is simply to appoint uh, negotiators. Um, and once that's done, uh, we'll hold a closed session where the board will have an opportunity to instruct the negotiators with respect to the district's negotiating position. Okay, are there any questions or comments on this? I don't see any from the board, it's pretty straightforward. Um, are there any questions or comments from members of the public? I don't see any there. So how about if, go ahead, Jamie. I was just gonna say, I will move to designate the district manager and district council's representatives of San Lorenzo Valley Water District for labor negotiations. And I'll second that. Okay. Uh, Bob, you've got your hand up. Yeah, just to be clear, um, given that the union has already provided notice of their intent to do this, um, we really would have to take some action one way or the other anyway. To have negotiators, otherwise you can't negotiate. So um, it absolutely makes sense for the two of you to be uh, those negotiators. Okay, Holly. President Mayhood. Aye. Vice President Ackerman. Yes. Director Foles. Yes. Director Hill. I'm sorry, Director Jeff, you're Hill. muted. Yes. And Director Smalley. Yes. Okay, passes unanimously. Next, we have the consent agenda uh, with the one item. Is anybody uh, from the board want to pull anything from the consent agenda? I don't see any hands. How about from members of the public? Okay, then without that, the consent agenda is without objection um, approved. Next, we come to district reports. Uh, Rick, do you have anything as district manager that you want to report tonight? Um, just the only, the only, sure the only thing I'd just like to bring to the board's attention uh, is the uh, Quail Hollow pipeline. It is approaching completion of the actual piping. They're almost uh, completed, um, and then they'll just have to, they'll have their paving and and their 
other work to be completed. Uh, the pipeline should be installed by the end of the week. They reported today at one of the meetings. And just to remind the board that the Quail Hollow pipeline um, is improving uh, an existing six inch main line to 12 inch. Uh, it will be a significant improvement to the district's ability to move fire flow from one end of the San Lorenzo Valley Water District to the other and give the district greater capabilities to move its water supply uh, when needed, where needed. This is a major improvement uh, to uh, our distribution system. And again, this is another great project that is improving uh, our water system. Well, that's that's good news. Thank you. So our super highway. <laughs> All right. Uh, next, we have department status reports. Are there any questions or comments on those from members of the board? Hang on. Raise my hand. Hmm. Mark. Yes. Um, on the environmental department report, it mentions uh, the Brackenbrae and Forest Springs consolidations for the um, environmental proposals that are due for those. Um, when are those due, Carly? I do believe Carly I has left the meeting. She's actually on vacation out of uh, area. Okay. She came on. I will find okay. that out and report back to the board. Thank you. Uh, anything else, Mark, or I'll go to Bob? Nothing else. Thank you. Okay, Bob. Yes, on the, I have a number of comments on most of them. Um, on the engineering report, um, Josh, it might be worthwhile on the Fall Creek Fish Ladder to note that um, the project will be rebid and constructed next year. Um, we have determined the path forward already. Agreed. We have determined the path forward. I hadn't wanted to put anything in my report until we've determined the exact details, simply because I'm reluctant to um, put anything in there without running it by Gina first, given the situation. And oh, since I have not done okay. so, <laughs> uh, short form, Director Foltz, is that because I have not experienced this particular situation before, I am being very careful not to get the district in trouble by putting something out into the public domain that I shouldn't. Since okay. I don't know what those things are, I am treading carefully and slowly, but I will be updating my status report for the next uh, next month's board meeting. Okay. And we will be going out back out to bed. Is there an expected end date for the GIS system? There is not. If you're, I'm assuming you're referring to the updating of the GIS with locations yep. of everything. Yep. There is not. I'm, my initial guesstimate was that it would be about a one year duration. We are eight months into that. And at this point, I think I was optimistic because we have had to pull Weston, who's our GIS specialist and is doing this work, off of that to help out with some other things. Uh, at this point, I'm guessing maybe looking at more like 18 months by the time we get through all of Juan Pico and all of some of these smaller roads where he's having to work a little harder to find all of our facilities. And you say 18 more months or? or uh, no, 18? 18 months total. 18 months total. Okay, so another um, 10 months then? In that, in that range, yes. Okay. Yeah, this is a real significant um, improvement to our uh, overall uh, data ops. So I'm glad to see that you're continuing to move forward on that. Happy to help. Yeah. Okay. Next one is on finance. So I think the budget committee had a little bit of a preview in this. I I will say that I wish I could manage my revenue, expense, and income numbers as um, closely as they are here, they all came in about 95.2%. Um, so that's that's pretty phenomenal. Um, do we expect to see those numbers change given that we're in August and that we should have collected all of the uh, uh, costs, Rick? I'm not sure, Bob. I'd, I'd have to, to look into that better and speak with uh, 
Kendra on that. Um, July, August are, are either one of those months are two top consumption months. Um, but I'd have to get that question answered by Kendra. Well, I think it's mostly expenses, uh, right. Rick, because we're, we're in a new budget year um, for revenue. That's right. right. Um, you know, we're still down several staff positions. Um, so I, I think that number will probably stay the same for a while. I mean, uh, we, I think we have four positions um, open at this time. Um, we did pick up one temporary just to because we were getting further and further behind in, in leaks and in other issues. Um, but um, I'm, I think it's going to pretty much hold the same for a short while until we get our staff thing back up and then mm -hmm. we'll have to even look at it closer. I did want to point out that um, our refunding bond has been paid off. That comes from, I think, the late 90s, right, um, Rick, for the North Boulder Creek? Right. Yeah, so that's that's great. Of course, now we've replaced it with others, but that's good. That's part of what water districts need to be doing all the time. Um, on the um, 2021-15 million um, loan, are any of these funds on that report on page uh, 220 um, the two point million and whatever we're going to spend, or any is any of that going to get um, uh, covered by FEMA, or is that in the separate um, report above the, like the little lion tank, big steel tank, that sort of thing? Yeah, well, those those will be covered by FEMA. The the projects that were you know pump CZU fire. You, you're on page twenty one. Yeah, uh, 220, 20 of forty two. Okay. Yeah, so we should see some of those dollar figures go down once FEMA starts sending us checks. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, it might be worthwhile then to add another uh, column to um, reflect the FEMA um, uh, money that's coming in. That'll be good because that'll give us more money for other projects. Okay. Um, next one is on page 23 of 42, page 223. Um, there was a uh, aqua metric um, line item for a new meter reading handheld. Are these devices, do they have maintenance available or is the maintenance just not affordable? I'd have to, to check on that. Um, this was an additional, uh, we've had so many changes in staffing and meter reading. We're trying to retrain a, a new staff for meter reading and we only had one of the newer aqua meters uh, or one of the new meter reading handheld. So uh, in order to have a second one to train appropriately, uh, we purchased okay. a second one. So this is an addition to what we had. Well, not a replacement. Bad. One failed, but I don't know if they have uh, maintenance agreements or not. I can find out. Okay, no worries. Um, on the operations report, I we, we might have covered this before, but I noticed that the production out of Fall Creek Bennett Creek in Bowl One and Two is significantly higher now than it is in, than it was in 2013. Um, are we still sending water to um, North um, System and South System out of Fall Creek? We are. Let's see. I'm looking at uh, page 247. Yeah, but we are still sending a little bit, not a lot. Uh, from Felton to uh, the north, not to South System. What accounts for that really big um, uptick in usage? Do we have any idea? I'd have to look at it to give you. Uh... I mean, it's it's like forty percent, which is really strong. Where everybody else is down, you know, sixty-two percent in the, or excuse me. Um, 40% in North Felton and Mignano. Yeah, it's yeah. interesting. Okay. I, I, it's just, I look for big differences. Well, like that. And, you know, and, and it, that's what stands out and um, definitely. I mean, Rick, isn't this largely just because of the emergency status where we can use more of the water? Previously, all we could use it for was in Felton. 
And well, so that's, that's, that's why I asked if he was sending water out to other places. Yeah, we, we, you know, we are sending we are. <laughs> some water into the, the north system outside of Felton, but we're not sending it over to the south system. I thought that was what Bob's question was. Well, it was, it was for both. I mean, so we're sending 6 million gallons out to the north system. I don't see that on the report. I don't here. see that either. I'd have to look into it and compare numbers. Yeah, I mean, I know that we're doing that, but I, this, this was just way off the charts. Yeah, I'll look at it. Okay, um, thanks. Jamie. Um, just a quick question about the operations report. Um, and I, I did hear Rick say that uh, we brought on temp staff because we were falling uh, behind on leak repair. I noticed that we um, addressed 25 leaks district wide. And I just wondered, um, and, and maybe it's something that we could add to the operations report as an ongoing stat, but I wondered if, um, like, what what is our ongoing overall percentage of water loss um, you know, non-revenue water loss on a on an ongoing basis. I think it'd be a good stat just to be monitoring in these reports. And and uh, Josh or Rick, do you have that off the top of your head? Don't have it off the top of our head. And we can get some comparisons. Um, it's it's a number that is difficult to quantify monthly, but we can we can get some ideas. We can take the basic production and and basic consumption. And, and and do a percentage of, of, of loss, but there's a lot in that percentage of loss. And I, I know that's something that this board has had a concern on over the years. And in fact, I do believe it's uh, one of my objectives to, to make that report and to get a better reporting on our unaccounted for water. Okay. Any other questions? Thanks, Jamie. Any other comments from members of the board? How about, uh, are there any comments from members of the public on- I think um, Mark was ra raising his oh, hand. Sorry, go ahead, Mark. Yes, I did want to pick up on that thread that you were alluding to, Rick. Uh, we did talk about mm -hmm. a, I believe you used the word a water loss audit mm -hmm. um, at the beginning of the year. And you made a commitment that we would see something like that. Uh, I I hope it's before Christmas. Okay. Uh, uh, well before Christmas. I'll, so, I'll take it as a Christmas present, Mark. Come on. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I think that that is important for us to understand. Oh, definitely. I mean, it's okay. an important number of our water loss and you know and in an older system um it could be uh you know as high as 20 percent. i don't believe it's 20 percent. i believe right. we're going to be down around uh 16 or in that general area um, right but you won't know until we look at the numbers right and um along those lines when we talked about the um, water leak analysis that was done uh, May uh, 21 timeframe. The board recommended do that on a two-year basis. Correct. So that's coming up again May 23 to give us another good data point on what we have as far as water losses that have developed over that period of time. Agreed. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Committee reports, any comments on committee reports from members of the board? None, how about from members of the public? I don't see any. So uh, we did not have any written communications uh, in this last interval. Uh, so without objection, I will then declare this meeting adjourned and have a good rest of your evening.